thing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these things. He brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary in his understanding, no one can fathom. He gave strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Well, what I want in the word of God this morning to Isaiah in chapter 40. And when I've been preaching on the last two Sunday evenings, we have been looking at this amazing portion of the word of God. We've looked at verses 15 uh, through to verse 26. And this morning I want to look by way of the third consideration of this amazing chapter, uh, verses 27 through to the end. How immense and glorious, and amazing, and powerful, and incomprehensible, and wonderful is your God. The God of the Bible is like that. Whenever you read the Word of God, you see something of the amazing immensity of the great God of heaven and earth. The one who fills heaven and earth. The one who spoke and this universe came into being. The one who set the stars in motion. He is beyond us and over above us. And yet he's able to look down and sit upon the circle of the earth. Have the circle of the earth as his amazing throne. And he's able to see men and women as grasshoppers. Or as can be translated locusts. There they are busy like locusts around the face of the earth. And yet he is sitting over and above it all, and his throne is the circle of the earth. And against that were the people of God down there in Babylon. And there they were, and there seemed no apparent deliverance, even though there had been prophecies. And they needed to be reminded of the greatness, of the majestic greatness of the God of the Bible. And we have looked to that over two Sunday evenings that the nations are, but as a small dust on the balance. If you went to the market and you asked for a pound of apples, you would not say to the man at the market, please brush the dust off the scales. That would be irrelevant. And so it is that God is so great and so immense that the nations are an irrelevance when it comes to his greatness. For they are but the small dust on the balance. What about the oceans? What about the waters of this earth? What could you hold in your hand? A tablespoonful of water? But in the hollow of his hand, the great God of heaven holds the immensity of the ocean in the hollow of his glorious hand. And his greatness no one can comprehend. For he is an amazing, glorious, wonderful, and incomprehensible, but a truth-revealing God. And how sad it was in verse 27 that the people in Babylon should have a complaint. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is disregarded by my God? You remember how that in the life of Jacob he looked at things so naturally. He had that great weakness. 
And yet God remarkably dealt with Jacob in amazing grace. And we read in Romans 9, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. For this man who was so weak and so frail and so fallible, and the people of God were so much like Jacob that there was a time when he wrestled with God and when he prevailed. And his name was given the name Israel. And all oh, that the people of God would be not Jacob but become Israel. And their complaint was, my way is hidden from the Lord. Down there in Babylon they thought that God had not taken notice of them. God has not taken notice of our condition and therefore our condition is hidden from the Lord. Why doesn't the Lord come? Why doesn't the Lord show us some concern in this situation in which we're found? It's an unchanging situation. That for many of these people was getting worse. And God seemed to be taking no notice of their condition. There seemed to be inactivity with him. And here we have a word. A reproof from God. If I am so great and so glorious. If I am so incomprehensible. then your interests are completely safe in my hands. You see, the word is hid is a very interesting word. God is ignorant of it. When my son was about ten years old, we used to go out on the cliffs at Westcliff, and we used to play hide and seek. And he was pretty good at it. And I knew that the only way I would ever find him is to keep one eye open. And I used to make out I was looking for him when I knew exactly where he was anyway. God's eyes were wholly open to the people. God was aware of their situation. God would come in for them at at his own appointed time. He knew that they were captives in Babylon. He had not disregarded their case. He was intimately acquainted with it and he was deeply concerned for it. But for his own glory, he had his own time when they would be delivered from their situation. And are there not occasions, my friends, for the Christian believer that the situation may go on and on and a particular situation that they have to face seemed unchanging. And the temptation is to say with these people, my way is hid from the Lord. And not only hid from the Lord, but my cause is disregarded by my God. Now the word hidden there is an interesting word because it is in a perfect tense which means a settled fact. It's a settled fact that my way is hidden from the Lord. He's he's disregarded my state and my condition. And the word disregard is is in the imperfect tense, denoting a continual experience. That my continual experience is that my way is hidden from the Lord. If he saw it, he'd do something. And in chapter 49 and verse 14 of Isaiah, God addresses this problem again. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Do you think Haley can forget her baby, Matthew? And have no compassion on the child she has born. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Now when we were in fostering, there were children who were abandoned. There was one family of four children that were abandoned in the social security in Victoria Avenue. If it's possible, says God, I will not forget you. 
And then God speaks in the most graphic way, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Look at my hands, says the creator of the heavens and the earth. Your names are there. You're there. Your wars are ever before me. Your situation is there. But I have my own time. Because you see, the first matter in the question is touching the very nature of God, that God cannot see the state when he can, and he does. And the second is touching the experience of the people, my prayers are never answered. You think of believers today in North Korea. Recently, dozens of North Koreans were arrested, accused of helping a detained South Korean missionary. 33 face execution on charges of attempting to overthrow the regime by conspiring with him to set up 500 underground churches. Temptation could easily be my way is hidden from the Lord. But it's not because God is mightily at work in North Korea where Satan's seat is. And God, as always, has an answer. Some people in this world have an answer for everything, but God has the best answer. Verse 28, do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. They needed a reminder of who their God is. He is the God of eternity. He is a God who had no beginning. He is a God who shall now have no ending. From everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. God has already mentioned some of the things that he has done in the previous verses in this chapter. He doesn't get tired or weary. He never has to postpone his purposes while he sits down and rests. He never gets tired or weary. No one can fathom his understanding. There are some people, aren't there, and you say about them, I never understand them as long as I live. But that's not the way with God. He is so glorious and so um, amazing in his ways and in his purposes that you can never understand God. What you have to do is trust him. For when it comes to understanding God, we can go so far and no further. For the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, and the things that are revealed belong unto us. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29. We see but a small part, he sees it all. And there is an ocean of wisdom, an incomprehensible ocean of wisdom, unexplored with regard to the being of God. What God has given us in the Bible is all we need to know. In the book of Job, there was that man, Zophar. And in Job 11, verses 7 to 9, we read these words. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths of the grave. What? And you know, their measure is longer than the earth and wider of the sea. Oh, so for if only you've made the right application. But such a God, such a great God is intimately aware of his people's needs. And we do not always understand the reasons for God's purposes. They are hidden from us in order that we might know what it is to rest in him. He is not inactive toward us. He is always active. For he is the eternal creator, the self-sufficient God. But he does share something with his people, amazingly so. When they go through times of difficulty, he shares strength. For in verse 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 
the weary. What does the word weary there mean? It means to be feel a failure under life's pressures. Now over the last three weeks, two different men in two different churches and nobody connected with this fellowship shared something with me. They both confessed to me that they felt broken men. And they are under two different sets of two different pressures and difficulties. And I would never swap places with either of them. Have you ever felt like that? I have. We can come here behind a smiling face is a broken man. What about the weak? It means to have no vigour or vitality. You ever known that? I've known that. And what it is to be an ME sufferer, I know that. And there are times when God makes us know something of our own weakness. Otherwise we would be proud, self-sufficient people. I can do people. And God's purpose in our lives is that we might be his dependents. And so often we are made to feel our own weakness and our own weariness that we might know his power. And that word power is a very interesting word, that word strength. It relates to the word bone in Hebrew. And it means stability, durability, stability. In all the words, God's strength makes the Christian believer stable. Are you and I stable Christians because of innate strength that he gives us? Even youths grow tired and weary and we know that young people sometimes can't get out of bed in the morning. Even use, but the word here for use is a very interesting word. Speaks of those who are young, those who are in their prime, those who are specially chosen for war. And those who are specially chosen for sport, those who are the most vigorous, those who are the most manly, can be paralyzed by fatigue. Even those who catch the eye of those who have to select them for some great sport, know what it is to be weary and tired. And young men stumble and fall. There they are. But those that hope in the Lord, Those that hope in the Lord. What is it to hope here? It means those that recognize that they have a certainty in God. Those who are waiting on God. Those who are resting on God. Those who have expectation for God. Those who have patience while they wait. Because these people needed it. And those who trust in an unchanging God. Will renew their strength. Well, we knew their strength. Here they were with a long and painful captivity in Babylon. And this glorious statement is for all those who know themselves to be weak and feeble and helpless at times. And is it not true often when you and I look at situations we feel helpless?
And suddenly the Christian believer is given a strength that is not natural. Strength that is not natural. Or it's supernatural strength. You see, they went to look at their situation and analyse their situation and be obsessed by their situation and think of all the things that could go wrong in their situation. They wouldn't, they weren't to be there and say, what might happen is this might happen. They were to be captivated by the greatness of God. And because they were captivated by the greatness of God, they were to have confidence in him and this amazing God before whom all the nations are as but a drop in the bucket, a little tiny drop of moisture in a bucket will be the one who will give them strength. That's amazing. And the word strength there means to cause to flourish again. You ever had a plant? And it looks so beautiful and suddenly it withers and you think there's no life left in it. And you think, well, maybe the compost heap is the next port of call for that plant. And suddenly you see it flourish. The shoots begin to appear in the plant and it begins to flourish. And that's the meaning there of the word strength. It causes a person to flourish again. The believer finds inner resources that have been given them by God to meet the trials of life, to be given strength in every situation. And is it not the testimony of God's people in their tired and weary state, in the tired and weary state of North Korea, to suddenly find an inner strength, you know? I know what it was to go and see the persecuted church in Romania. I tell you one thing. They weren't always talking about their problems. They were talking about the Lord. And about the things of God. But oh my friends, he gives you wings. (coughs) What are your wings like this morning? Verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar up. They will soar on wings like eagles. I used to have a favourite film that was made in the 60s, I believe the late 60s, called Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machine. Some of you are old enough to remember it. If it was ever on the telly, I used to be there watching it. And at the beginning of that film, it spoke about efforts to fly by man. And some of people had wings on the side of them to try and fly, but they all ended up on the floor. And many efforts to man try to get himself to fly ended up a complete disaster. There's no disaster here. They will soar on wings like eagles. What's the wings of an eagle like? They're vast, aren't they? The wingspan of an eagle is vast and powerful. And the wingspan of an evil eagle is there for strong and rapid flight. They're able to fly up to an immense height, especially the eagles down there in Babylon. And the eagles can remain at that height with their wings outstretched because of their amazing strength that they have been given. And they can swoop down on their prey like a thunderbolt. The believer who hopes in the Lord will be soaring on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. In other words, they're able to look down upon their situation. From the perspective of God who sits upon the circle of the earth. 
And two things will happen to them. We have that here. Four things will happen. Two things will happen to them. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. They will run. What a change. They will be vigorous. They will be elevated. They won't be weary. Those who trust in God, those who hope in God, their faith is strengthened. Their desires for God are increased. How have you come here this morning? Oh, these, these were verses to encourage. And as we've looked in the previous two Sunday evenings, we have tried to see the great immensity of God. God's people needed down there in Babylon to be reminded of that, don't you? Don't I? But you know, the book of Isaiah also tells us something amazing as well. Something else amazing too. But at the end of chapter 42 and into chapter 43, it tells us of God's amazing son. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. His visage was marred more than any man's. God's amazing son. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 is all there. And it all tells us of this one who was to come, this one who was to leave the holy of holies and enter into this scene of time in order to bear away sin, in order to be crushed by Yahweh, in order that we might go free. If God should give his son for you and me. If God should order in his sovereign purposes the gift of his son. The sinless son of the most high God. And take every detail into his heart and mind regarding your salvation then your circumstances are safe with him. Even though you don't understand what God is doing, you must see them in his hand. My times are holy in your hands. And maybe, in some cases, instead of, please pray for me, it will be changed to let me tell you what God has done. I pray that those two broken men that I spoke to you about will be repaired very soon. And be restored very soon. I'm trying to help both of them. And they'll soon be soaring again on wings like eels. And they run and not grow weary, they walk and not faint. I pray that if you come here this morning broken, your soul and wings like eels, your hope in God, hope in Yahweh, you trust Him, for all be worth, you trust Him. One last thing. Is he your God? This great God is your God. Have you got a personal relationship with this God? Because my friend, the Bible tells me very clearly that if you're not a Christian, this God is your enemy. What? Your enemy. Because every day that you live in this world, you live in rebellion against this 
amazing God who has the very next breath in your life in the hollow of his hand. I wouldn't have God as an enemy if I were you. And he's made an amazing provision for you to change from being an enemy to a friend. And that amazing provision was in the death of his son. Have you come as an enemy to Christ? And have you bowed before this sinless son and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? And you know what it is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb and all your rebellion to go and to know that you have been loved with everlasting love. My chains fell off, my soul was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. And this great God who sits upon the circle of the earth, who has the circle of the earth as his glorious throne, as we saw last, the other Sunday evening, is the one who sent his son for individuals. Young, old, rebellious, sinless. And who cleanses them in his sinless blood and makes them saints. Are you a child of God this morning? I beg of you to seek the Lord Jesus while there is time. Let us pray.